Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so this is uh, the second um, meeting, uh, the second interim meetings for us. So um, uh, as 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 usual, uh, the not well applies here. So if you're not familiar with this, make sure you you familiarize yourself with this because this um, uh, governs everything that we do uh, at the ETF. So it's important that you understand this. Um, Today we'll be talking more, mainly about OAuth 2.1. Uh, as you see, this is, we still have a long list of uh, uh, upcoming meetings. Um, next week we'll have two topics, uh, client intermediate metadata and multi-subject chart for next week. Um, uh, but today we will be focusing on OAuth 2.1 and Aaron will, uh, will walk us through this. Um, any questions? This any question about the the next meetings? Any comments? Um, hi, Rifa. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for being a few minutes late. Uh, meeting ran over time. Yeah, no worries. Th th thanks, Hannes. Um, okay, good. So um, I'll then hand it. Uh, I'll stop sharing here. Let's see, and I'll hand it to. Her. Thanks. Let me share my slides. And while okay. while uh, Aaron is sharing his slide, please go to that link and add your name to the list. Uh, if you haven't done so, and I think uh, see we have uh, about twenty three people here uh, on on the conference, the web conference, but. Uh, I don't see 23 on the on the page there. So please add your name to the list. It's like I can't share a single window. Is that true? It's only letting me share the whole application. Well, I guess that's what's going to happen. Huh? I, I was able to share a, a window only, but that's fine. All right. Yeah. Okay. So thanks everybody. Uh, let's jump in. So um, I want to start with an update on the changes since the last draft, which were, uh, I believe, approximately six months ago now. Um, we've gone through the, the main changes were driven by feedback from Justin and Vittorio's very excellent and very thorough reviews. So uh, everybody should say thank you to them for their detailed feedback the um sorry somebody is feeding back audio into the call still i believe there we go um so yeah there's a lot of primarily uh, editorial changes that were based on feedback from justin vittorio that was a lot of stuff that uh, i just kind of took took the editorial decision to uh, to go and make those changes. A lot of it was rearranging things or moving things around, clearing clearing up terminology. Um, so no really functional changes there at all. It was it was um, just cleaning things up. There were a couple of mechanical bits as well. The terminology and references um, to previous RFCs that have since been updated themselves. So things like HTTP. Uh, semantics have been replaced with references to the current HTTP semantics, not the older ones. Um, and then the comments from Justin Vittorio that have not been incorporated, things that I thought were either um, required some more discussion or either on the call today or in just in um, in GitHub. That kind of those kinds of things are all open to as issues on the GitHub repo. So basically, I went through all the feedback and I was like, okay, these I feel like are easy. I'm just going to make these changes. These ones are a little bit harder, so I'm going to punt on those and we'll discuss them um, later. Later. So that's the main changes since draft zero zero. Um, there, also based on this feedback, that feedback, and based on the conversation that the editors have been having we have a couple of 
changes we are planning on making and have not yet actually had time to do. So um, these are all opened as issues again, so we can track them on GitHub. Um, the first line item is getting through the rest of the feedback from Justin Vittorio. Um, the bulk of their feedback was in sections one through six, because that's where most of the spec is. Uh, sections seven through 13 have not yet been processed. So I'm gonna do the same thing there of um, incorporating the, the easy changes and opening issues for the more difficult changes. Um, 61 is a uh, major refactor that we want to do, which is um, section four is the section that's currently called obtaining authorization. And that's the section that talks about um, how to start the authorization code flow. It used to also contain how to start the implicit flow. And um, it also talks about client credentials, which is the sort of implied authorization because the authorization is the credentials themselves. So that's kind of awkward having that fall under the term of authorization. And the refresh token section lives in a totally different part of the spec right now. So we want to rearrange section four to talk about, to be about, this is how to talk to the token endpoint, where it talks about all the, you know, authorization code flow, as well as client credentials, as well as refresh token. And that way we can spell out um, the, like the parameters that are required to talk to the token endpoint and all the mechanics around that. So that's gonna that's some bit a bit of work. So we we're tracking that, but that is something we're planning on doing. Um, Sixty five is a uh, a interesting one that probably is worth talking about a little bit on this call. Um, the the task for us was to find out from uh, the security aspect is if the requirement of single use authorization codes is no longer necessary if you're also doing Pixie. The main reason for single use authorization codes before was to avoid um, like authorization code injection attacks and things like that, which are less less likely and um, you know things are things are different when you're using Pixie. One of the motivations for relaxing that requirement is that in practice, I know there are several authorization servers that do not enforce single use authorization codes. So this is again, an attempt to sort of document what's actually happening in the real world, rather than um, being too overly prescriptive and people will just ignore it anyway. And then lastly, 64, um, the, the plan there is to, um, the security BCP spec kind of got brought in under the security consideration section of 2.1 and the security BCP actually does contain some normative language because it is trying to change OAuth 2. Uh, a lot of that language would fit better now in line in the spec, in the main part of the spec. So the idea is to go through the security consideration section, which is mainly text from the security BCP, pick out all, all the normative language, all the requirements and put it up into the spec where it actually is described in the first place. So yeah, these are all things that the editors are um, planning on doing. And unless there's any huge objections to this, um, we're just gonna go ahead with those. Uh, okay, oh, Daniel is on the queue. Do you wanna jump in now? Cause I think the next, yeah, the next section, I have a couple of issues to bring up for the group. So we might as well um, start that right now. Yes, uh, so this was for the number 65 that you have on the slide there. Um, I do not think that this would be a good idea. Um, the single use requirement of the authorization code, I know that in practice, it cannot always be enforced or enforced um, uh, in, in cases where you have um, requests happening almost at the same time and so on. But nonetheless, I think it's a very uh, strong security feature and it has not lost its importance with, importance with um, Pixie. Um, for example, if you have a, an attack where the, um, where the attacker is able to control parts of the authorization request, so a chosen um, Pixie challenge, um, or if the attacker somehow is able to see parts um, of the token request co uh, containing the Pixie verifier, um, 
Or for example, if a client uses a static pixie value, which of course it shouldn't, but still a um, client might do that. Then all of these cases, uh, and probably some others that I'm um, not uh, that have on my mind right now, um, we see that the single use requirement is still a major hurdle or can be still a major hurdle for attackers in um, several scenarios. And um, I think it's, it's uh, so this is one aspect. I think it's just still important. Also, um, if we want to relax that, um, we might need to think about um, what actually happens then. So is the AS supposed to send the same access token? Do we have two access tokens? Um, so what's the semantics behind that? Behind that? OK, uh, Justin? Um, yeah, I agree with Daniel. Uh, I think there is still value in authorization codes being single use, even under Pixie. Um, however, I think what would be beneficial, having talked to a lot of developers about this over the years, is uh, clarifying what we actually intend and expect single use to mean, um, because we don't mean you have to remember all authorization codes for all time and never see another one of the same value ever again. Uh, but we also don't mean uh, you can, you know, you can forget as soon as you issue it and like let, let somebody replay that a bunch of times or something like that. Um, most implementations I've seen are burn on first use, um, and that's how they interpret that. We might want to capture that if uh, if that's what the working group really intends for this uh, to be. Um, but if we mean something else, like you know. Uh, instead of just burning it on first use, remember it for a few minutes in case a replay comes back or something like that. Um, that type of description will have um, will have direct consequences with how people actually implement this feature. Okay, uh, Dick. Yeah, to echo Arn Justin's comments, single use implies that it's never used again, which would require you, tech, you know, if you're reading it carefully, to mean that you're remembering everyone you've ever ever issued. And I think we're really trying to say that there's only that code. There's only that code is only valid for one outstanding valid request right now, something like that. So, I, I think we want to rephrase it for what we mean, as opposed to the easy description that we have here, but that isn't, would require you to have something with massive entropy to actually implement properly. Okay. Uh, Philip? I don't mean to, for this to sound like I'm piling on, but yeah, um, you know, echoing what, what Justin and, and Dick just said, with the exception that we re definitely want to rephrase it to what we what we needed to do, where if the replay one comes in, we ideally want to mention that you should revoke all the previous tokens issued from the original one, so that it being actually replay protected serves a purpose. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, my main my main question in regards to that, um, I, I I understand all that for sure. Uh, my main question is the fact that there are servers in the wild that don't do this currently, even though it is described in OAuth two point um, Are we just no, no change for them? They're they're still sort of non compliant under the new two point one as well. Then. Is that the best best way to handle that? Torsten, you have a you're on the line. You want to ask it? Well, this is not a this is not a response to Aaron's question. Okay. So, um, I, I wanted I wanted to 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 add to what uh, or re reflect on what just was said by Philippe. Um, I mean, the rationale for bringing that topic up was to um, simplify implementers' life. By not enforcing the single the single use requirement for authorization codes. Now, if we are heading uh, along the road that Philip just illustrated, we are make that 
requirement even more difficult to implement because uh, if a replay is being detected, uh, Philip suggested to also um, revoke the uh, the token or the tokens issued based on the authorization code, even though I understand the rational, um, especially in cases where self-contained access tokens are being used. It's I don't any I don't know any mechanism could be utilized by a SRS pair to really revoke this access token, except you have a back channel, a co some kind of proprietary back channel communication mechanism that in the end revokes a token or you, you um, force the resource server to, to introspect the access token with every request, which in the end would kill scalability completely. So I think we should be carefully uh, with the requirement um, of what's going to happen if a replay is being detected. Just wanted to point that out. Okay, um, Daniel. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, Philip, you want to jump in? What was yeah, if, if Daniel's okay with it. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I completely get that. And there's a, you know, you can revoke access tokens up to a limit if they're self-contained, um, mandating introspection on every single use of an access token doesn't make sense it de de defeats the purpose of them being self-contained um but i'm i'm trying to echo what we did for the rbc certification where we actually have tests in place where you can pass certification if the reuse is there within 30 seconds uh, but after 30 seconds it's um it's a failure and now this could be more directed than mike jones who could say what we check for with regards to the issued tokens. Okay. Um having a uh, replay within a time window isn't isn't any different than just having it expire normally anyway. Uh it's different for like refresh tokens, you know, because their lifetimes are a lot longer, but in general authorization codes are short lived. So if they are used multiple times within that window, that's not any that's not anything special compared to that's not like the difference between relaxing the single use versus just saying there is a timeout on them. Um, this is Mike. So what Philippe is referring to is in the open ID connect certification suite. Uh, we did in practice find that Way too many implementations uh, actually used time based enforcement rather than acid consistency across a database that's distributed. Uh, they made the trade off to uh, stop it soon, but not be the hit of synchronicity. Uh, therefore, in the test suite, we just require it to be a failure after 30 seconds. That's kind of an arbitrary number. But, uh, you know, the result is you can't keep using it forever. But it's not necessarily a timeout either. It, it's, I think it was Philippe earlier saying that a lot of implementations in practice uh, don't do the replica consistency necessary to really enforce the hard limit. Okay, it, Daniel, you're on the queue. Yes. Um, so plus one to the uh, to a more precise language around what we expect um, the AS to do uh, when replay is detected or for detecting replay. Um, but to a more general point, um, we also need to keep in mind that. As far as I know, we still have still allow cases where um, nonce can be used instead of Pixie. Um, so if we would relax the single use requirement for Pixie, we would also need to think about the consequences when using nonce. And I fear that this would further complicate the spec, um, maybe unnecessarily. So I'm hearing two two competing sides to this right now, even though we're all mostly in agreement. On the one hand, 
everyone agrees that the security of single use is good. And the spec should say they should be used usable only one time. And then in practice, we know that that is not practical. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to get at here with, with raising this is that if we know that people are not doing it, we need to be providing guidance to help people accomplish what we're actually trying to do by requiring authorization codes to not be able to be reused. It sounds like we have a couple of things we could do immediately anyway to um, improve this, I guess, um, at the very least being more specific about. We're not saying globally unique forever authorization codes. We're actually meaning that reusing them is the thing that's not intended. Um, so maybe we can at least. Move that forward and then um, try to find more language to clarify this as well for the other for the other cases. Uh, if nobody has any other comments on this, I guess we can continue on to some of the other um, discussion topics. Yeah, I don't see anybody in the queue, so we have to move on. Okay. Um, Torsten, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. Um, so, as uh, most of you know, um, the security BCP um, now was um, changed to recommend the um, issue response parameter as a defense against um, AS mix up attacks. And the question uh, that we would like to raise is whether we should um, add the issue response parameter um, to OAuth 2.1 um, just to have a, um, a solid and simple mix-up prevention for those clients that need it. Right now, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think we have any text about the issue response parameter in the draft. Correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron. There's no reference to it currently now. Okay, okay, okay. And it, it somehow also um, contradicts our original um, or the approach we want to take and to only add mature um, um, elements um, of OAuth um, to OAuth 2.1. But I think um, this is a kind of an exception because the working group after some hard work came up with a really simple solution to the uh, mix up a problem and um, yeah, we would like to discuss whether it would make sense to to add that parameter uh, to the spec in the same way um, as we added Pixie, for example. Just to clarify, it would only be recommended if clients are expected to use multiple ASs. It would not be recommended for the simple case of a uh, single AS. Yeah, that's what I meant with the last with the last um, with the last statement. So only for those clients requiring mix-up pr protect protection, and this is what Daniel is uh, much more better <laughs> to, to talk about that attack uh, for clients that are subject, and those are the clients that interact with multiple ASs. Okay, M Mike. Yeah, I, I hear you, Torsten, but I also think we should stay with the shared intent of this spec, which is to codify what people are actually doing. Um, and as soon as we entertain adding the issue or response parameter, we're also going to have discussions about, well, you don't need it when you have an ID token with an issuer. And I realize connect is a profile of OAuth 2, but it's a common profile. And it, that would be another case like nonce where, well, you don't need Pixie in some cases if you have nonce. You wouldn't need the issue or response parameter if you have an ID token. Um, you know, if it's recommended and you don't need it at, when there's an ID token, you know, I'm not going to 
lose sleep over it, but I, I think we're on dangerous ground when we start extending it rather than just codifying what is already in use. Well, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you, Mike. And um, the alternative is to uh, stay quiet about mix up and let people run into the mix up problem. I think we as authors are very good uh, in the meantime to uh, state what we think is, is, is the right solution and then carefully define the exceptions, especially for those that really use um, connect built in countermeasures. We have done that with Pixie and Nuns, and I think we can do that with Issuer. And um, the issuer in the ID token as well. I mean, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong. We also we already have um, this kind of text in the security BCP that uh, talks about both options. Yes, um, to be precise, it's in the latest um, pull request around um, the exactly this parameter. And um, yes, we have an exception if the ISS value is contained in another way in the authorization response. Oh, I, I kind of spoiled that. Uh, the, the next upcoming revision of the security yes. BCP. <laughs> I will, I, I will, uh, oh, we will hopefully publish a new version before the um, interim meeting around the security BCP. Yeah, M Mike, would that would that address your your concerns around that? Um. Yeah, like I said, I won't lose sleep over it as long as we carve out the exception for this frequently occurring case. But just in terms of looking at OS 2.1, it means that we're just adding more. But I, I'm happy with that stuff being in the security BCP, and people will read it there. I, I hear you, uh, but that the idea of OAuth two point one was to get rid of the security PCP as one of the documents that an implementer needs to read. Right? We wanted to consolidate OAuth two point zero, um, the Barrel uh, the token draft, security PCP, and a lot of other PCPs into one new baseline. That that's the philosophy of OAuth two point one. So, from my perspective, someone reading OAuth two point one does not need to even consult the security PCP. That was the basic idea, at least uh, as far Is as that I what others think? I thought we were trying to staple together the parts of OAuth to 6750, 6749, and Pixie that people use in practice or that we want people to use in practice. I didn't think we were getting rid of the security BCP. Well, that I mean, we, we we can we can check back uh, the, the the meeting minutes from Singapore back then. But I'm quite sure, looking at the current status of the OAuth two point one draft, for example, we integrated all the considerations, security considerations of the security PCP, and we also integrated all the other BCPs such as SPA and so on and so on into two point one. Yeah, to echo Iron Torsten's, that the goal was to include the BCP so somebody could read 2.1 without having to read another document and be able to do the right thing. Okay, well, if that's the case, it uh, furthers Torsten's argument to include this. I hadn't realized we were going to try to get people to be able to do this without reading the security documents. Well, the idea of the BCP would be to continue to be updated and I'd imagine after 2.1 ships, it'll be updated with new practices that um, aren't included in 2.1, but in 2.1, we should capture the state of the industry. So there's one document. Uh, since I've got the mic, I was in the queue, just wanted to clarify that this is uh, not a must, it's a, a should. And I also agree uh, with your point, Mike, that uh, what we should, the normative language is that the issuer should be included in the response either as an ISS parameter or in any other way where it's included in the response, which would cover it being included in the ID token. Like I said, I wouldn't lose sleep over that approach. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, Daniel, you were in the in the queue. Do you have anything else to add, or um, no? Maybe just highlighting that um, 
the ISS parameter is really the only solid risk, uh, solid uh, protection against mix-up attacks that is left um, because even the um, per issuer redirect URIs have their flaws. So we really need this parameter if we want to defend against mix-up. Okay, Vittorio. Um, I just wanted to uh, add my support to uh, covering this aspect. I think that uh, multi-issuer is an underspecified aspect and that a lot of people encounter in practice. And so as long as it should, and as long as we call out explicitly that the ID token is equivalent, I think that uh, it's going to be useful for people to have uh, the multi-issuer scenario addressed explicitly into that one. Okay. Anybody else has any comments about this? Okay. Aaron, back to you. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I guess uh, to, to Torsten, is there anything else you wanted to talk about this issue before we move on? No, thanks. Okay. It, it seems that there is... Okay support, enough support here for, for this. Uh, so I don't see anybody screaming against adding this, right? Great. Yeah, and we'll just make sure that the way it's phrased does not require the particular parameter in the response. It's requiring the value to be provided in the response in some way. Okay. Um, well, I guess kind of along these lines, same similar uh, space the um there's still kind of a open question about the specific wording for referencing the open ID connect implicit flows so and there's a whole bunch of different ways we could approach this in, in 2.1 um and i think they have a lot of very different uh properties of them so the the um, the state of the document right now is that there is nothing in there called implicit anymore at all. There's just no mention of it. And um, there is the specific carve out for Pixie, which says if you, I forget exactly the wording, but it's it's basically so that if you are using OpenID Connect's response type ID token, you don't need to use Pixie if you're following those rules. That's the carve out. Um, the question is, is that is that good enough, or should we um, add more text to clarify the the intent here? So, the fact that the the response type token is completely uh, gone now, the there's you know some discussion about is that going to be confusing to people uh, who are seeing response type token elsewhere, for example, in OpenID Connect. Um, so the sort of options laid out here, we can just not mention anything, which is kind of the current state. Uh, we could explicitly state that removing response type token does not directly deprecate anything else that may be built on top of OAuth 2.0 or 2.1, but you know, go, go investigate that on your own. Uh, we could three, explicitly prohibit response type token um, which is effectively what the security BCP is doing. We've just removed that language because it's not defined in 2.1. Another option is to explicitly allow a response type ID token um, with the condition that it's not being used as an access token, which is a common uh, mis mis implementation that we've seen. And then uh, another option is to encourage OpenID itself to officially deprecate the response types that contain token, which is the access token in the response. So those are sort of the options we thought uh, to, to lay out. So I'd like to open this up for discussion. OK, Mike? Um, not to add more to more, but Vittorio made a really good point in one of his reviews, which is that the security characteristics of implicit using a fragment are completely different than the security characteristics of implicit using response mode form post. Um, even if because of the possibility of 
token logging and capture that goes with implicit in the front channel, if we use form post response mode, uh, it's not the same thing and there's no reason we should be deprecating that. Uh, so, I would, you know, just I would, of, of all the bullets you have up here, I would just stay with no mention if you're not going to talk about it. But if you do talk about it, you need to say that form post response mode is different than fragment. I, I, I hear that. I agree that it's different. I don't think that it's necessarily the same as avoiding the implicit avoiding the uh, authorization endpoint returning the token at all. It still is handing it to the browser to deliver to the application, whereas um, it's not it's not as secure as the application getting it from the back channel. So I don't think that I would I would not feel comfortable saying that it is safe, um, and I would definitely not want to recommend re uh, response mode form post at all in this in this draft. I obviously it obviously does not protect against replay. It might be have better cap uh, um, capabilities regarding leakage protection. But it does not give any any means to detect a reply, and that's what I would be really reluctant to state about anything about that. Well, then let's stay with no mention and only talk about stuff we want people to do, and not place value judgments on things we don't want people to do. Okay. Um... People in the queue, Jeff. Uh, yeah, really, I was just kind of agree with what kind of Mike was saying there. Um, I, I don't think it's really worth um, bringing up things that are outside of the the scope of the specification, um, especially when it comes to extensions like OpenID Connect and everything. Um, and yeah, really, just to kind of agreeing with that point. So. Okay, Vittorio. Uh, here, I have to apologize for the broken record effect, but uh, <laughs> I have to. Um, uh, although from the lawyer perspective, we are perfectly fine with uh, not mentioning anything because uh, people familiar with uh, how specifications work can uh, deduce that uh, the fact that we omit this thing in here doesn't really prevent OpenID to use uh, implicit for ID tokens. Um, I still have a problem with all this because uh, in practice, I have a number of uh, customers, uh, people in the community, People that uh, now look at uh, software out there that use a form post and just ID token. So there is no access token whatsoever. And now these people have a, a superficial read of a spec and they say, well, I can no longer do this. So what's your alternative? When are you going to give me a new version of SDK? And I don't want to give them a new version of SDK because uh, sending ID token via form post is perfectly fine. It has uh, no bearing whatsoever with uh, the reasons for which we are omitting uh, implicit in here. So all I need in order to have uh, my life easier and their life easier is something in the spec which says, uh, don't worry, that particular case is fine. And I think that not saying anything does not solve that particular problem. I think that the last thing you mentioned in here, encourage OpenID to efficiently deprecate uh, response types containing token is good, and we should do it uh, independently. Like, uh, uh, but I think that having some clarifying, uh, uh, some like clarifying language in here would simply solve that particular problem, which is not an imagined problem. I had to, like, I had that is this conversation already many times since the BCP. So in in here, just for being uh, uh, concrete, I think that uh, the number two in that list is the one that would uh, uh, help me the most. Like a vet would prevent that particular conversation. Thank you. I mean, the second, the second bullet would basically mean um, that we state um, that just because we remove token doesn't mean that other response type are rendered invalid. But we would not take any position regarding um, those response types. I personally think that uh, it would be a much better way if the OpenID Connect AB working group would uh, take the opportunity of um, the fact that there is work on OAuth bullet one going on to um, develop a, a position and also publish that position, might it be via a blog post or an updated specification, 
um, stating that uh, given the latest development OAuth, uh, for example, we will uh, continue to support those response types for the following reasons, and we will um, yeah, remove other response types um, for the following reasons. I mean, that from my perspective would be the better approach because in the end it's OpenID Foundation that's responsible for those. Thorsten, I agree with you that uh, it would be good if uh, OpenID people would do this. But at the same time, in the spirit of uh, we want people to be able to look at one document and have yep. uh, a good view, and uh, then we are integrating uh, a number of OpenID spec, uh, a number of uh, off specs in a single document. We are integrating the BCP in a single document. This thing happens to be under a different uh, institution, a working group, but still, we know it is relevant for the people that work in this space. So asking them, uh, like, uh, if people only read this document and they don't read all the stuff that, let's assume, the OpenID people put out, then we will still be in the same uh, position. I want to push back on that, Victoria. Um, you know, somebody implementing OpenID Connect needs to read the OpenID Connect documents, which then refers to OAuth. I don't think it makes sense for OAuth to refer up to something that's using uh, OAuth. Well, yeah. wait, uh, I didn't follow. I think that uh, we are doing this uh, already for uh, the nonce, and uh, we just discussed uh, doing this uh, when we discuss uh, the is. So it doesn't seem like there is uh, a prohibition in doing that. Maybe I didn't understand what you were suggesting then. No, what I meant is, uh, even if uh, once you get to the implementation, you also have to go and consult content from OpenID Connect in order for you to form an opinion and uh, uh, push back on uh, the, uh, the use of implicit for ID tokens. All you need is to read the uh, to read the two dot one, and then. If you also read the OpenID stuff, then uh, we'll be fine. But if you don't, then you stop there, and then you start uh, uh, having discussions and escalating, saying, uh, uh, I need to get rid of uh, implicit because this document said so. Then uh, we could, if we have this stuff from OpenID, have an easy answer and just point them to this documentation instead of, uh, as we do today, engaging. The thing is that uh, I would like to avoid having the conversation altogether. So just having one line that says, and by the way, the fact that we don't mention this thing in here for access tokens does not jeopardize any of the things that we have uh, uh, that, that are out there using ID token. That, that one single line would be enough for me not to have all those conversations. Even if those conversations a... now would be giving people a URL to a post from OpenID. Uh, I, I don't I agree with saying OIDC up. But you, are you, I mean, you're not suggesting that someone's going to impl implement OIDC without reading the OIDC docs, are you? I hope not. No, no, I, I get, I get what Vittorio is saying. Um, I have a suggestion to maybe uh, a question for Vittorio. Um, right now, there is no mention of implicit or any response type other than code in the body of the text or in the security considerations. It would be nice to keep it that way. Would it solve your issue if in the change, like the changes from OAuth 2 section to mention what you're talking about, where it's not part of the, the normative part of the body, but it's, we already have a section in there called like, why, how is this different from OAuth 2.0? And it kind of lists things out. Would that be an acceptable place for what you're talking about? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be in the normative area, as long as if it's in the document, like here, we are talking about people that don't know exactly all the details of uh, the uh, spec bureaucracy. As long as it's in the document, I do control F on the browser and I find it. Where is it? I don't care. It will be, it will serve its purpose regardless of where it is. I think we, uh, we, uh, there's also part of the, of the spec mechanics that uh, I think allow us to do so because the, the response type um, registry was defined by RFC 6749. So we can reflect on that, take a look into the registry and can talk about which of those response types from our perspective um, are uh, are removed and which uh, are uh, no, recommend, no longer recommended for use and which we all think are okay. But that needs from my perspective, a cooperation with uh, the OpenID Connect working group because we need their feedback and uh, an agreement on that or consensus, I think that's a better term.
And that sounds viable given that uh, there is a non-empty intersection between the two groups, including yourself. I fully agree. <laughs> I would be much happier uh, with the, the sort of mention of uh, the, the the caveats or what it's not deprecating if it weren't in the security considerations, if it were only in the change log section. Is that, um, how do you feel about that, Dick? Say that again. Sorry. The the sentence that Victoria is talking about of, of saying that removing, you know, leaving this response type token out doesn't affect other extensions, that's something that if we mention it in the differences from OAuth 2 section, I'm a lot less worried about it being mentioned there uh, from the, the spec point of view. I mean, this my main one. concern is we, we don't want to reference another spec. Um, we do right. want to make And that's why I mean, it's not. We do want I, 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 to another spec yeah. when it's yeah. in the. The one thing um, I was going to say earlier was um, we for sure don't want people to be confused about what they can do that that what is in OID open ID sorry what's in OIDC's latest doesn't conflict with what OAuth 2.1 says that people aren't sure which one's correct so I'll agree with that I agree very much with that part of Victoria's statement um Putting it in the differences can potentially help somebody. I mean, we we just I agree we don't want to say something that's going to make it hard for other things to do so. I suggest just let's give it a crack and discuss discuss a proposal. So th this is Mike. To... Go ahead. This is Mike from the queue. I think that. Adding a sentence or two, as Victoria suggested in the changes from OAuth 2 section, would be a, a path forward. We can always revise what that says, but that's probably better than saying nothing for his thoughts about trying to avoid customer conversations that result from confusion. Thank you. Okay, um, Aaron, we have five minutes. Do you have more slides? Oh, I think, or is it? Yeah, there's one more. Um, I don't know if we can. I don't. I, it doesn't feel like a five minute discussion to me. So um, maybe I'll just bring it up, but not expect to uh, have the discussion on the call. We can continue the discussion on the list instead. So, so um, I see somebody like Roberto on, in the queue. Is it, Roberto, do you have a mm -hmm. question about this slide or the next slide? No, uh, a general question, not uh, for discussing now. Um, a new uh, a newcomer in the Spirit community, and I was just curious if, in doing this work, uh, you could consider in evaluating the latest. HTTPS uh, specification because on some issues like TLS, uh, the HTTP workgroup um, made a great work in tuning up stuff uh, around certificate validation and full source security consideration. So um, this is was just dropping a rock in the in the pod and um, just think about it and um, and that's it i felt some issues and pull requests uh, in relation with tls and tls consideration with oauth is that is that a, do you have a specific topic in mind or is it just a generic comment about yeah I, I i noted while reading the document that in some parts uh, the specification said you must use tls you should use tls uh, 
sometimes you don't need to use CLS. And as a first reader, it was very confusing. I see. Okay. Uh, Mike? Yeah, in some sense, referencing the additional response types, really there's a question deeper than that is, I think we should make an affirmative statement that the registries established by 6749 and friends remain valid and used with OAuth 2.1. It's through that registry mechanism that response types such as ID token were able to become part of OAuth 2. And I think we should reaffirm that we continue to use all those registries. That would necessitate needing to update the registry to include recommendations against token and why we're including recommendations against token though. Well, so. Yeah, that would have been my next my next question. I mean, would we would we want to change the registry content or just move on to use another registry that we built from scratch? I think using another registry would defeat our goal of having this be compatible with OAuth two. We need to augment somehow the registry content. Or make comments on some of the entries in our spec, but I think if we bifurcate the registries, we might as well call this OAuth 3. Okay, guys, Can we, <laughs> we don't get into OAuth 3 right now. We have one minute here, so uh, do you want to wrap I mean, we up? Can, we can remove, oh. yeah, we can remove response type token from the registry in this update, right? Because that would be not, not, changing the you know response type ID token from open ID connect or anything. Uh, and that would give it that would give the spec something to do with the registry other than just referencing it. Again for anti confusion we should affirm that we're continuing to use the same registries. Okay. Um we, we are almost out of time and I think um Vittorio is suggesting one more interim for 2.1. Uh, be happy to schedule that and see lots of support too for that. Um, that's fine. I'll uh, I'll um, I'll try to arrange for one um, to continue this because uh, it's it it was a good discussion here. So um, okay, let's wrap it up then. Um, I will. Uh, any any last minute comments from? From you, Aaron, and team. Yeah, that's great. We have a lot of work to do, and hopefully, um, the next meeting we'll have a bunch more changes to uh, to talk about. Sounds good. Okay, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Very good. Oh.